Uh, hi everybody, I'm Kristen Liotaku and I am an online video producer, which is just a fancy title for YouTuber. <laughs> and um, you can find all my social media links right over there in case you need to contact me. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about why we are what we wear, whether you're a style icon or if you're not interested in fashion at all and just wear the same thing every single day. We all wear clothes. This is something that involves all of us. So I know this is a vegan festival, so I can imagine that most of you here have already thought about what your clothing or accessories is made of. But how many of you have thought about who makes your clothes? Any hands? Awesome. Okay, maybe I should just walk out then already. <laughs> um, but about four years ago, I actually had no idea. I thought that clothing was manufactured from machines because it didn't make any sense to me that humans could actually produce clothes for such a low cost. But as it turns out, I was pretty wrong about that. Um, after years of research, reading articles, watching documentaries, and creating my own mini documentaries for my YouTube channel, the face of the fashion industry has just kept getting uglier. But that isn't always how I saw it. So that is a catalog photo that was posted on Zara's website a few years ago. And if you zoom in a little bit closer to that photo, you're going to see me looking very disappointed that it's Monday again. <laughs> and um, I used to be a fashion blogger. I started in 2009, and since then, <laughs> since then, Zara uh, Inditex, which is Zara's parent company, bought two photos from my blog. They printed them on T-shirts, mass-produced them, and sold them worldwide. But fashion blogging was more my hobby. The main thing that I was involved with was shopping at fast fashion brands like Zara, H&M, and many more. Um, but at the same time, I was a pretty broke college student. So how could I be a shopaholic? How could I afford to be a shopaholic at the same time and also, you know, be broke? So um, as it turns out, fast fashion is cheaper than a meal, so I figured out that I could just skip meals, save up, and buy clothes instead. And I would buy leather, even fur, even things that I didn't like. There was no offer, no bargain that I would say no to. And I refused about a thousand euros in exchange for that, uh, for the rights for that photo, but the person that made that t-shirt was probably not even paid one euro for it. I'm thankfully not the girl that you see over there, but there are still many garment factory workers that are fainting in factories from over exhaustion, that are dying in factory fires, and are being severely underpaid for their labor. Um, but the fashion industry very purposefully doesn't want us to think of the people that are making our clothes. Instead, they want to hide behind the flashy advertisements, the glamour, and selling us the fantasy that if we um, buy clothing that are worn by beautiful models or famous celebrities like Beyonce, David Beckham, or Katy Perry, then um, we are going to be as happy or as beautiful as they are if we just buy their clothes. Fast fashion brands know exactly how to connect to our basic instincts and manipulate us to keep unconsciously shopping. And while the owners of these companies keep getting richer, the clothes that we keep buying just keeps getting cheaper and uglier, and we never end up looking like the photoshopped celebrities in the advertisements. So in order to end the inhumane and wasteful cycle of fast fashion, today I'm gonna give you the information that you need in order to start shopping more ethically and also the vocabulary and the information that you might need in order to communicate this with other people. And uh, to kind of communicate also the importance of ethical fashion. So let's start with fur. I can imagine that most of you in this room probably already don't wear it and you're not supportive of it. But why do some people still wear it? It's considered a kind of a luxury item, uh, a status symbol, and a lot of people justify this purchase by thinking that fur is a byproduct of the meat industry. 
But that couldn't be further from the truth. Animals in the fur industry are bred exclusively for it, and they are in many cases skinned alive, and their meat, in a lot of cases as well, is fed back to the other animals that are raised for fur. Um, thankfully, this is something that a lot more a lot more people are now no longer supporting it. A lot of fashion brands are no longer using fur because we have um, the alternative to fur, which is synthetic, is uh, pretty much the same thing. It, it rivals real fur in luxury and softness and appearance. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, still a lot of celebrities like Rihanna, Selena Gomez, Lady Gaga, Beyonce, still wear it. I'm saying that so I can shame them here publicly on stage. <laughs> so um, yeah, so another thing is that uh, cheap synthetic fur, oh, um, sorry, uh, a lot of people like to bring up the point that synthetic fur is not really that sustainable. But to that, my answer is, what if real fur was made out of our pets, out of cats and dogs? Would we then be even bringing up that point? Probably not. And here's a little secret, actually. Cheap fur that is imported from China, in a lot of cases, has been found to be made from cat and dog fur. Thankfully, more and more people are refusing to wear fur. But what about leather? So many animal lovers recoil at the thought of ever having to wear fur but at the same time, we're very comfortable with wearing leather, even though leather is pretty much fur just without the hair on it. Um, so unfortunately, also, the global leather goods market is set to grow by almost 5% by the year 2021. Fur and leather are pretty much the same. The only difference is what animals each material is used to make it. And also, for leather production, it involves a lot of human suffering and environmental pollution as well in order to create it. So in my opinion, I find leather to be even worse than fur. Chromium, which is a material central to the processing of leather, is so incredibly toxic when inhaled that workers in leather tanneries have a 20 to 50% chance of getting cancer. Moreover, these toxic chemicals are dumped into surrounding water sources, polluting them and causing various illnesses to the nearby communities of people. The world's largest exporters of leather are China, India, and Bangladesh. And as you can imagine, the last thing workers in those countries need, on top of being exploited for their labor, is getting sick just so we can have a brand new pair of leather boots. The tragic irony here, again, is that just like with fur, there are alternative, cruelty-free options available out there. Animals don't have to die so that we can be fashionable. So what about wool? It's simply sheared off of sheep. They don't have to die, so it must be better. A lot of us have this idealized picture of chubby, fluffy sheep pasturing out in a green field, but unfortunately, that is an unrealistic picture. Sheep that are raised to produce wool for mass production resemble more that of factory farming. Australia is the world's largest wool producer, followed by China and then the USA. And in order to maximize wool production, merino sheep were bred into reality, sort of in the same way the dog breeds were created. And they have larger skin folds in order to maximize wool production because with larger skin folds, more, there's more skin for more wool to grow. But unfortunately, with these skin folds, parasites fester in them. And fly strike is one of those parasites that led to the beginning of mulesing, which is a mutilation practice where the skin of the rear end of the sheep is chopped off without anesthesia. And just like with any other industry that exploits animals for profit, sheep are also many times brutally abused and wounded while getting sheared. And of course, they are ultimately slaughtered in the end for meat. Finally, there's down feathers. Down is used in jackets, coats, and vests, and it's derived from ducks and geese that have their feathers ripped off of them without anesthesia while they bleed and scream in pain. And then angora, suede, fleece, mohair, exotic skins, and silk all come from animal cruelty as well. If our clothing could talk, it would be screaming. The glamorous world of the fashion industry is looking a lot uglier now, isn't it? 
But the exploitation and lack of humanity only begins with animals because the people making our clothes don't have it much better. Sweatshops have existed since the beginning of the industrialized garment production. My own grandmother, when she was an immigrant in the US back in the 70s, actually worked in a sweatshop and the owner of the sweatshop would import clothing from Turkey and have my grandmother and her coworkers sew made in the USA labels on them. He would also try to scam them from giving them their full wage and also he would try to stop them from unionizing. But you would think things have gotten a little bit better since the 70s, right? Well, things have not really gotten better. They've only gotten worse. On April of 2013, the Rana Plaza building in Bangladesh collapsed, killing more than 1,100 people and injuring another 2,500, making it the fourth most devastating industrial disaster in history. Some of the brands sourcing from factories in the Rana Plaza building include Primark, Benetton, Mango, and Walmart, to name a few. And I think that all of us here can agree that if this disaster had taken place here in the West, adequate action would have been, would have, would have been taken in order to ensure that sweatshops were a thing of the past. But because the victims were strangers in a faraway land, we all just decided to forget about it and just keep up with business as usual, shopping more than we ever have before, actually. So how bad are things for workers in garment factories, really? Even though things have slightly improved in Bangladesh since the Rana Plaza collapse happened in regards to safety, things are still looking pretty bleak. In Bangladesh, garment factory workers earning minimum wage made a little more than $50 a month, while a fair living wage would be $200. India and Cambodia follow a similar pattern. The truth is in just four days, top fashion CEOs earn a garment worker's lifetime pay. But that must be because CEOs work a lot harder, right? Well, let's find out. So human rights Watch reported that garment factory workers are forced to work for 14 and even 16 hours a day in hazardous working conditions. Female workers face sexual harassment, they don't receive any maternity leave, and they're fired if they get pregnant in a lot of cases. There's also, in a lot of cases, factory management prohibits the creation of trade unions, and workers have even had their life threatened for protesting. Many sweatshops use child labor, even slave labor, and on top of all of that, workers are constantly exposed to harmful and carcinogenic chemicals that are used to dye or process the clothing. But sure, those workers, those CEOs work much harder. Perhaps they're working much harder to hide the, this truth from us and also convincing us to buy their unflattering, ugly clothing. So every time we purchase clothing from fast fashion brands, an insignificant portion of the money that we are giving for that product actually goes to garment workers. We're not supporting them by buying clothing from fast fashion brands. As long as we remain silent and keep supporting these brands, we are saying that we support workers being in unsafe working conditions, and we agree with the astronomically huge pay gap between workers and CEOs. And one more thing the fast fashion industry is succeeding in is destroying the environment. As I mentioned before, the toxic chemicals that are used to create vibrant colors, prints, and fabric finishes that are harming workers' health are also, unsurprisingly, polluting the environment. Um, moreover, uh, the, the toxic chemicals are getting dumped in nearby streams and rivers and because clothing keeps getting cheaper and cheaper, people are buying about 60% more clothes now compared to the year 2000, and about 40% of it is never worn. By buying more, that also means we're throwing away more clothes. Each year, on average, US citizens alone throw away about 70 pounds of clothing, and 5% of all landfill space is actually textile waste. And it gets even more devastating when you realize that um, a lot of clothing that is produced today is 
either a synthetic blend or completely synthetic, which means they're not biodegradable. And also every time low quality cheap synthetic materials are washed, tiny particles called microfibers shed off of them. They end up in our waters that are later on in our seas, in our oceans, where they get, where they start consuming toxins and pollutants. Then afterwards they get eaten by uh, tiny microorganisms that are afterwards eaten by fish. And at this point, about one fourth of all sea life contains some type of plastic in it. But this is still gross even if you don't eat fish, which, great job by the way, um, because even our water now contains plastic in it. So this is the, the cycle of our clothing from on top of our bodies to inside of it. So this all sounds pretty bleak, but there are plenty of solutions. We all have the power to change the face of the fashion industry by simply changing the way that we shop. You've probably already heard many times about the five R's of sustainability, which are refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, and recycle. Refuse to shop from fast fashion brands. Reuse the clothing you've already got. Reduce the amount of clothing you buy to only the clothing that you actually need. Repair your, dam your damaged garments before you write them off completely. And finally, only recycle and donate as a last resort. It's very important to also change our financial relationship with buying clothing. So instead of throwing um, our money away to cheap, low quality, low quality garments, we, we have to become more comfortable at investing in high quality, timeless pieces. Uh, because they're not only going to last longer, but also it is sort of an investment because we can afterwards, if we get bored of it, we can resell it for a similar price. We can pass it on to either our siblings or our children. Uh, so it's not a bad investment at all, in my opinion. We can also discover sustainable brands um, and local designers and support them. Not only are they less damaging to the environment, but they also employ workers that they pay fairly. And Good On You is a great app that you can use in order to discover brands like these. You could even take a shot at making your own clothes if you're ambitious and creative enough. But my favorite way to shop ethically and the most affordable option, in my opinion, is thrifting, buying secondhand, buying from charity shops. Um, and plus, you don't have to contribute to the uh, production of new clothing in this way. So it is more sustainable as well. Finally, it doesn't have to end here. You can also contribute by reaching out to your favorite brands, asking them to be more transparent about their production chain, or asking them to stop using animal materials, and use your voice to change the fashion industry. Our demand for cheaper clothes made the fashion industry the way it is today, and our demands are gonna change it into something much better in the future. Thank you so much.